for your back. Um, it's been really fun this month to hear all the comments so the people that have been able to come in and see the exhibits this month. I think there's just a lot of been a lot of appreciation and I'm glad so many of you could come out tonight to hear a little bit more from Blair about her work. And um, yeah, I don't have too much more to say. Um, so welcome Blair. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming out. Um, and engaging with my work and coming to hear a little bit more about it. See some familiar faces, which is nice. Um, I get really nervous in front of other people, so I wrote down a little something that I want to say, and then um, we can, you know, talk about it later. Or I'm, I'm, you know, here to answer any questions that you guys have about the work that you see. First of all, i just like to say how grateful I am to have all of you here supporting me and being willing to take this journey with me. I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about my work with you. I've prepared something to read and I know that there will be, and know that there will be the opportunity to ask questions once I'm done reading it. I know hearing someone read can be less engaging and feel less like a conversation but I'd rather be boring and articulate about my work <laughs> instead of risk going off on a tangent and never coming back. I describe myself as a textile artist who paints with fabric and draws with thread. At first, it was very difficult for me to talk about what I've created. When people approach me and say, tell me about your art, it feels like they're saying, open your heart to me. To which I'd instinctively like to reply, I'm not sure we know each other that well yet. <laughs> but for all of you here tonight, I'll do my best to try to open my heart to you so that we can share this experience with each other. Um, first, I'd like to talk about my craft, or more specifically about how the work in front of you is physically made. Um, I'm not a quilter. For me, the word quilter assumes mastery of various sewing techniques. My sewing abilities are very minimal and I'm self-taught. Um, I know that when I put two pieces together and slide it under the needle of my machine, it will connect the two pieces. And that's pretty much the extent of my sewing capabilities. I have a lots of respect for master quilters, so I definitely want to make that distinction. I don't sketch anything out ahead of time. I just hold it all in my head. I use fabric of varying textures, shapes, and sizes and place them on a large blank piece of fabric like you, and I cut out small pieces and I place them like you would a brush stroke to a canvas if you were a painter. Um, I, my pieces that I cut out are very small. Most of them are about an inch in diameter but many are smaller than that. And I place several small pieces at a time while I process what I'm doing and what I'm trying to create. Once I feel solid about what's happening in front of me, I tack each piece down with a tiny bit of fabric adhesive to hold the pieces in place while I continue placing the next several pieces. Batiks are my favorite. Um, and I'll pass this around. This is kind of an example of a batik. They look um, it's material that looks hand dyed and it can almost look painted. Um, so if you guys want to check that out a little closer. Um, and it's my favorite to use because of all of the subtle nuances in the fabric. Looking for pieces to use is like a scavenger hunt for me. Not just in the fabric store with what fabric to choose, but even within a single piece of fabric itself. I scan every square inch of the material, looking for the right color gradient or shape or blending of colors within a single square of batik fabric. I don't just use batiks, I use um, anything, anything I can get my hands on, but I'm really drawn to fabric that's designed that way. I don't measure anything, nothing at all. I eyeball it, which is part of the reason why my work is irregular shaped. I don't measure, I feel it out instead, and when I've arrived at the conclusion that the composition is complete, then I make the work more permanent by sewing it together. I love thread. 
I love the kaleidoscope of colors in my collection of thread, and I love that I can add fine detail to my work using thread, and I love how challenging it is to draw with. Once I've sewn it together, at that stage the piece feels finished, but I still have to mount it. It took a long time to decide how to display my work. I thought about hanging them like tapestries, which is a pretty traditional way to display fabric, but that didn't feel right from the very beginning. So then, for months, I thought I was going to stretch them over a frame like you would a canvas. But my work wasn't perfectly square or rectangular because I don't measure anything, and it wasn't perfectly flat because I don't iron anything. And the thought of changing my approach to accomplish that particular way of presenting them, measuring and ironing and conforming made me feel stressed, honestly. So not only did I not want to incorporate those things into my process, I did not even want to consider those things. My images desire both structure and movement. So I had the idea to mount them on some sort of shapeable wire. When I mentioned this to very few people who knew what I was up to, I got a lot of hesitant head nodding with oh's and hmm's, um, which were not altogether encouraging. But then I told my daughter Maddie about my vision, who is an artist herself, and she said, yes, yes, do it. They'll be even more dynamic that way. And I highly value her opinion, especially when it involves something creative, and Maddie totally gets me. And so in that exchange between her and I, full of energetic and excited vibes bouncing off of one another, it became clear to me that I should follow my creative vision no matter how weird it is. <laughs> then I made my daughter Luella's portrait, which is the one back here in the corner. As I was creating it, I felt very strongly that it did, that I did not want the image. I felt very strongly that not only did the image want both structure and movement, like the other pieces I created, it also wanted to explode. I shouldn't box her in. I couldn't box her in. And if you know Luella, that probably resonates even more. Once I mounted her portrait this way, I absolutely fell in love with it, with using a freer form like that. And so with every portrait that followed, I stopped not in an, at an edge, but wherever it felt natural for me to stop, whatever the shape may be in the end. These portraits took me a tremendous amount of time. Uh, the time it took was in part because I was experiencing a learning curve figuring out how to do this. But even when I arrived at a place of confidence with what I was doing, it became very clear that this work, the way that I do it, it's so meticulous and it simply takes a tremendous amount of time. The least amount of time I spent on one portrait was around 200 hours. And each portrait took me a minimum of three days just to sew it together. I'm talking eight hour days or longer sewing. Um, I think one of them I sewed for 18 hours one day and I was halfway done with it when I finally went to bed. So blood, sweat, and tears were all involved in creating this work that you see before you. Yes, I said blood and I mean that too. In the process, I once managed to put the needle of my machine straight through my finger, trapping myself to my machine until someone came to rescue me. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> now I'd like to share with you how I got here, how I came to this craft and how I found my voice by creating my own language, if you will. My children participate in a particular Native American ceremony and it is a very big deal for them and for our family. I was required to make blankets as part of their offering for this ceremony. <coughs> because these blankets were made as a spiritual offering, the process was very spiritual for me. And because it was the only way that I could contribute to this part of my child's spiritual journey as a non-Native woman, I poured everything I had into those offerings. 
I have always been a creative person, and so I couldn't simply do squares for these tremendously important offerings. I instead use each blanket to depict or represent the Native American names that my children had been gifted when they were born. In the process of creating their blankets, I taught myself to sew and eventually arrived at this art form, and now I cannot seem to let this love affair with fabric go. Even still, though my work is no longer ceremonial, it's very spiritual for me. An image comes to me first. The images are like visions that nag at me, much like a dream you've had that you can't stop thinking about. I feel inspiration channeling through me faster than my fingers can move. It's not until the piece is finished that I ask myself, okay, now what is this meant to communicate to me? The decisions I make are not what will the image be. I feel like that is instead decided for me. So the decisions I make are on how to best recreate the image in my head. It's not until the end that I ask myself, now what does this mean? Often the meaning comes in waves or layers over time. And sometimes this revelation can take months. And like the interpretation of a dream, you may have insights into the meaning that, are e that either are or are for the time being lost on me with these portraits. These images may speak to you in a way that they do not speak to anyone else. For several of the portraits in this exhibition, the story has not completely unveiled itself for me. Instead, it's still in the process of slowly unfolding. And for the portraits I feel I've adequately deciphered, I still continue to make new connections to see things I hadn't before. My artist statement about the portrait I created of my husband is a good example of what I mean by this. And this is the portrait over here in this back corner with my husband sitting right in front of me. <laughs> this portrait is about my husband's life's work as an educator and an activist, preserving his language and culture for generations to come. The goldfinches are flying out of his mouth as he bestows these gifts to our son. This portrait took about five full days just to sew it. When I'd finished and I had laid it flat on my kitchen table to admire it, I quickly realized that it would not lay flat. It had ripples that created a circle in the center of the portrait. At the time, I'd intended to stretch my portraits over a frame like a canvas but this one would not lay flat. I cried, not knowing enough about sewing to know what I'd done wrong or how in the world I was going to fix it. I felt completely incompetent. I walked away from it in a panic, hopeful that if I just took some time to breathe, that I'd figure it out. I went to bed, couldn't sleep, came back out in the middle of the night and spread it out in front of me again. I'd always felt like these portraits weren't mine, that I was just the vessel from which they came. Then suddenly when I looked at this piece and the unintended circular movement that had shown up unexpectedly, they looked like ripples in a pond. That is exactly the nature of my husband's life work, to affect change, one small movement that steadily grows and expands exponentially over time. I don't know how it got there, but it absolutely belonged there. A sacred symbol for many cultures, the circle, an ancient and universal symbol for wholeness and unity. So I'd like to dive in and tell you a little bit more about what you see and what my work means to me. First of all, I am well aware of issues concerning cultural appropriation. My dearest friend, a Native woman, expressed concern early on in this project about what people would have to say about me creating images that represent and are absolutely about Ojibwe culture. To that, I'd like to say that I recognize that that may make some people uncomfortable. And I'd love to have a conversation about that, should it be anyone's concern. 
I've not created this work to be provocative. And I will not shy away from that conversation should anybody want to have it. What I would like people to understand is this. What you see before you is what my life looks like. These are the people with whom I've most intimately connected. And in this show about identity, it was incredibly important to me to accurately depict my family members as authentic to who they are as I could. So there are three portraits in this show that I feel portray Ojibwe culture so clearly that it would not be lost on anyone. I would also like to say that these three human beings in particular, my son Evan, over here in the yellow, my son Isaac, right next to me, and my husband, all hold their heritage in very high regard. These three Ojibwe men, Evan's now 14, so he's getting closer <laughs> to being a man, um, but for these men in my life, they absolutely want you to know that they are Ojibwe. It is central to how they see themselves. They would not want that to be lost on you. And so, to be true to who they are, these images are exactly how they needed to be made by the non-native woman who loves them. The goldfinch is a constant in my work. It is the language bird in Ojibwe culture. And in my work, however, I have expanded their representation to include the entire Ojibwe cultural and spiritual toolbox if you will, which includes the language. But what I've experienced with traditional Ojibwe culture and spirituality is that it is so much deeper than a simple, simple representation of past customs. The traditional food, clothing, language, and music, etc. it all has layers upon layers of meaning that means so much more than that. Those things, Explain to them how to connect to the earth, to the spirits that dwell here, to each other, and to oneself. Those things are heavily saturated with meaning. The birds represent that depth of knowledge and understanding that my family and other Ojibwe people who follow a traditional path possess about who they are, where they come from, and what their purpose is while they're here. So for example of how that representation plays out in my work, I'll explain a little bit about the portrait titled Prayer for Jordan, which is back here in the corner, um, the darkest portrait in the series. <clears throat> Jordan is my oldest child. She has struggled with drug addiction for a decade, has been in and out of treatment, in and out of jail, and has lost her children, who are featured in my portrait of my son Robert, right next to her, um, who dropped out of college to raise them when they were removed from my daughter's care. The portrait is a prayer that those cultural and spiritual ways of being represented by the goldfinches may overcome her vision by blocking her access to the destructive influences she's become fixated on. The cultural toolbox, as I like to call it, is a birthright, but it was also gifted to her. And it feels as though she has neglected to open the box for some time now. Um, the wire mesh that I mounted my pieces on are visible in parts of this portrait, representing the cage, both literally and figuratively, that she keeps not only her heritage in, but the cage her body and spirit are in as well, having been placed behind bars several times. I encourage all of you to be prayerful as you interact with those particular pieces. 
as uncomfortable as it is for me, publicly sharing her private struggles. I know that she can't do this all alone. In addition, I believe that the more we see each other, actually see each other, the more love and support we can generate from each other. And my hope is that by sharing this, she will have the full weight and breadth of this community rallying behind her. Even if it's just through prayerful thoughts, because those are incredibly powerful. The goldfinch represents the awe-inspiring beauty and magic that I've been fortunate enough to witness and in some cases access living this life that I live. This show, The Portrait Series, is an exploration into the role Ojibwe traditional cultural practices and beliefs plays in shaping the way my family sees itself collectively, the role it takes in shaping the personal identities of my husband and my nine children, and the influences or effect it's had on my own personal identity. As a white woman, the only non-native person in my immediate family, this exhibit is about my, reflection as, my reflections as an outsider and about the emotional roller coaster I often ride as I stand fixed on the outside but privileged enough to look in. This exhibition is not just about the pieces of Ojibwe culture I've been allowed to see, but also what it's allowed me to see within myself and even to recognize what cannot be found there. My self-portrait, which is over here in the corner, is about the cocktail of both despair and hope that I feel as a mother and wife in this family and about my purpose in this world. I'm in the dark and naked. I often feel I have nothing to offer my children or my husband. I am of Scandinavian descent, but I don't even know what that means to me. I don't have ways of being handed down and taught with purpose. I don't have things that are known by my people and through my people from ancient times. I don't have spiritual gifts, birthrights to bestow, no toolbox. I'm just out here winging it, loaded up on American culture, gas stations, shopping malls, McDonald's. I didn't realize how little I had until I realized my husband had so much. I didn't know how lost I felt until I became aware of how sure-footed my husband and my children are. But I have hope. The antlers are on top of my head as if to say, there is something incredible about me too. I also possess a spectacular gift. I can't see it, but I can feel it, as though it's within my very bones, passed down from my ancient tribe too, and someday I'll know how to use it and be empowered by it. I would like to create these portraits and to be here with you. I want to thank those of you who've connected with me about my work and everyone who took the time to share my work with someone else. I'd like to thank the McCrusty Art Center and Katie for um, working with me and for allowing me the opportunity to connect with your community. I'd like to thank my children for supporting me, for tolerating me take over the kitchen to create this, this body of work. Um, and of course for being the inspiration for this show. And I'd like to thank my husband. He is the reason this exhibit exists. It's about him as much as it is about me. This man, the way he lives his life, the work that he is called to do, and the things he's gifted me all these years, that's the heart of this show. You are what my heart wants to celebrate. I love you. Thank you. Thank you.